But if we don't reuse the data and create competitive advantage with that data, shame on us, because that data that you use for regulatory reporting, it's also useful for, for marketing, for risk management, for finance, all kinds of other things. Welcome to My Data is Better Than Yours, the data podcast. Welcome from my side, a new English episode. And um, yeah, warm welcome to Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Thank you. Greetings. Could you more or less um, yeah, introduce yourself and uh, the company you are working in? Because I already had a chance to... Um, Ask Google for my guest, and it's amazing. Sure. Uh, so I'm Stephen Robst. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Teradata, and we uh, provide a uh, cloud platform for data management and analytics. Uh, and then I've been CTO of the company since 1999, when my MIT startup company was acquired by, at the time, NCR. And then we I was part of the team that took Teradata public when we spun off from NCR, uh, went public on the New York Stock Exchange. So, so you are more or less the 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 techni technology guy behind Teradata, right? Wow, there's not just there, there are many technology <laughs> people, uh, male and female, behind Teradata. Yeah. So yeah, I'm one of I'm one of the army. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's always one or two persons facing to the or the face to the customer, and yeah, yeah. And I had a chance to to check your track record, and I think it's very amazing, right? So you had um, some cha or a chance to provide a report for Barack Obama. You had a chance for more publications and more stuff like this. Yeah, I'm a bit of an academic gone into the commercial world. So I uh, have published quite a few papers, both in academic journals, as well as more commercial journals, uh, co-authored uh, in a couple of books. So yeah, I, I, I tend to write a lot uh, and when I'm not coding, I guess. So either I'm writing code or I'm writing uh, words. And uh, the the work with uh, Barack Obama's uh, Council of uh, Advisors on Science and Technology was definitely uh, Uh, one of the more interesting projects they worked on. That was kind of a dozen of us, uh, mainly academics, mainly pure academics. I was one of only two people from the commercial world uh, on that uh, committee. And we made recommendations uh, to the president for what investments should be made uh, around specifically big data uh, to sort of position us uh, as a country, as a leader in areas such as education and transportation, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Is there any chance to have a more or less management summary as an outcome or what, what, is your, what is your advice Well, I'll tell you that the uh, the last sentence of the final paragraph in the executive summary to the president yeah. was, every government agency needs a big data strategy. That's the bottom line. Oh, uh, that's nice. So we, we need to take the data from all those sensors out there and, and then do interesting things with it. That, that was the bottom line. My area was specifically in healthcare. I'm very interested in, in healthcare. Uh, although we, you know, as a group of us, we participated in all, but we took certain areas where we tended to have more focus. And I was focused on healthcare and, and software engineering. So Yeah. And to be honest, um A big data strategy should 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 or all companies should have a big data strategy, right? Uh, absolutely. Although, to be honest, this uh, big data terminology, I, I don't really like this this word. Uh, to me, it's it's all data. It's all interesting. And uh, big data was kind of a marketing term at that time that we wrote the report. Uh, but really, the the point is data and all varieties of data, not just record-oriented structured data, but semi-structured data, unstructured data. Uh, there's lots of insights to be had from a wide range of data, whether it's big data or small data. Uh, you know, the goal is to create value from that data. Yeah. And I, I, do you think if you compare the maturity of the companies today to 10 years ago, what, what do you think? Is there a, a big development or do you think we are until now 
slow? Uh, well, we're always slower than I would like, but there certainly has been a lot of progress. <laughs> Ten yeah. years ago, almost everybody was still on-prem with their data and you know, building data warehouses and similar kinds of things uh, uh, in on-premises appliances and such. Today, I think most of the, at least the innovative companies have pivoted to the cloud. And I would argue that innovation happens much more effectively in the cloud than it does on-prem. And, you know, people sometimes get this idea that they're moving to the cloud to save money. And saving money is always a good thing. But I think if you're moving to the cloud just to save money, you've missed the real point. You're really moving to the cloud to innovate more quickly and more effectively. That's the big value in the long term from, from my perspective. And um, as you mentioned, if you're if you're not having the the right goal or the right strategy, uh, moving into the cloud, you will for sure fail, right? Or you will have the the wrong key measures to yeah, ensure. You'll be, yeah, you'll be you'll be heading in the wrong direction. And if you have the wrong uh, measures, then you get uh, the wrong behaviors, right? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, th this was you know this was a problem in actually the the big data. Uh, you know, mania of 10 years ago that, you know, people were measuring success by how many bytes they put on disk drives rather than the value they created from the data. Bytes on disk drives is a really good measure of cost. It's a very terrible measure of value. Uh, and so one of my pet peeves uh, around data is when people refer to data as an asset. This is yeah. actually not how we should think of data because assets we we accumulate, we put in a warehouse, maybe a data warehouse, and we <laughs> count how many bytes we've accumulated and how much history we have and so on. And this is really not the right strategy. I would like us to think of data as a product. And the point of a product is to be consumed and to create value from that 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 product. And, and one of my other pet peeves is this term that uh, I think it was The Economist originally made the quote that data is the oil of the 21st century. This is terrible. Oil is a terrible resource. You burn it, it creates pollution. Uh, it's, it's after one use, it's gone. Uh, data is so much better. Data is reusable. The more you use it, uh, the better it gets. Data is a sustainable resource. And 10 years from now, I would Sun. suggest that oil uh, is actually not interesting. Uh, yeah. I would suggest in 10 years from now, data is super interesting, even more interesting than it is today. So I, I hate this analogy of you know, data being the oil of the 21st century. You know, data is way, way better than oil. Yeah, and, and, and that's very, very, very interesting, Stephen, because if I compare companies, if they treat, as you said, data as as it, if they treat data as oil, and if you compare companies who treat data in a different way like like if we if we use buzzword or on analogies more or less like the sun so you can reproduce it we can you re recycle it in a different ways you have a central place where a uh, central place where you start with the um, with the value change then you will and if you compare then those different ways you will see that the um, the companies who will treat oil uh, data like like a sun um or something like that um They are more, yeah, effective, effective, or more. Well, they're more um, competitive successful. in the end, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, so yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. I think it's a really good point that you made. Here's the anti-pattern: we have something that we need to solve with data, and we create a point solution with the data, and we tick the box that we delivered a regulatory report, uh, and then we're done. This is terrible, right? The whole point of data is to create reusability of the data. And, and so one of the, the chief data officers that I work with, a large bank in, in the UK, uh, he talks about the regulatory dividend. If we need to bring a bunch of data in and integrate the data and then produce reports for regulators and so on, that's great. We need to do that. Uh, but if we don't reuse the data and create competitive advantage with that data, shame on us, because that data that used for regulatory reporting, it's also useful for, for marketing, for risk management, for finance, all kinds of other things. And we shouldn't have islands of, you know, isolated point solutions. We should be reusing the data to get the, the maximum value from the data. Yeah. And uh, what I always recommend, and, and uh, happy to hear your thoughts, is um, we we don't we should not do a customer journey mapping we should do a data journey mapping if you compare from the left side etl elt processes to the right side data activation visualization data science and stuff like that you should always 
tackle your use cases to compare if I use, if I integrate this different data source or this data source, which of those data use cases at the end could I tackle with the same data source, with the same model to ensure that within one model, within one data source, I could tackle different use cases and could, let's say, um, yeah, get a lot, of, a lot of things done. Yeah, one of the large um, American telecommunications companies that I work with, they do this very interesting thing. They have this scorecard and they keep track of the, the use cases of the data and which data that the use case consumed. Uh, and, and they track the reuse of data across the different use cases and they keep score of when they add a new business application, how much new data do they have to bring in versus how much did they reuse? And because they're relatively mature in their, their data and how they integrate the data and so on, in most cases, in excess of 90% of the data is already there and they're reusing it. Maybe they have to add a little bit here and there and so on. But in most cases, you know, the bulk of the work has already been done from a data provisioning point of view. The data has already been used. So the quality has some level of assurance to it. Uh, and and they, they're a lot more agile. Uh, it, it's interesting. There was a, a um, kind of academic paper that was published by Google uh, a while back that uh, observed that, you know, when you look at these uh, data pipelines that are created by data scientists yep. uh, in a large enterprise, uh, more than half of the data in most data pipelines is duplicated in half a dozen or more other data pipelines. And and that's that's really a shame because we're, we're not as agile as we could be, we're not as cost effective as we could be if we took a more enterprise approach to reusing the data. On the other hand, you know, we have to be careful. Enterprise approach sometimes is associated with high governance. Uh, yeah. and, and the more governance you have in many cases, the slower you move. So you got to get the right balance between enterprise reuse and what I call minimum viable governance, the minimum amount required in order to drive, you know, connected data products instead of isolated data products. Yeah, that's amazing. And Stephen, that's, that's what you already said, right? If you if you treat data like a classic asset, you will protect it like an asset, and one department will for sure protect it, and there will be not the communication over over the whole organization to ensure that we had this kind of data within this use case, and this could be the benefits for the purchasing department instead of the marketing department, or they could more or less exchange in a better way. Yeah, I, I'm a huge um, fan of self-service. To your, to your point, we want that data to be consumed. Yeah. And if I'm a data scientist, anybody between me and the data is the enemy. And yeah. <laughs> usually their name is spelled DBA, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the DBA is, no, 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 you can't access the data. You're going to make the performance bad. It's going to cost too much money. So on. This, yeah. is, this is very counterproductive for, for innovation. So yeah. we need to make sure that financial controllers and DBAs are not creating friction in the innovation process. And, and this is one of the beautiful things I like about the cloud because you can provision resources. You can do the innovation. When you're done, you shut it down. The cost goes away. Uh, that's not the case in, in, in the on-prem world because you get this innovation hangover when you you know you brought in some hardware with gpus to do the machine learning and it turned out not to be the right algorithm for what you were trying to you know to to learn and and now you're stuck with this this infrastructure and uh it's no good right so you really don't like don't like this capex model uh especially when you're innovating and, and cloud is just the the opposite uh and is it is much more beautiful than uh than on-prem for for innovation specifically Yeah, my energy for those thoughts is um, wedding, wedding. Uh, so, what is what is the key <clears throat> factor for success on a wedding? I think it's it's what what you provide on for for the lunch or for dinner or whatever, and then you can serve it as menu or you can serve it as buffet. And I love to serve things based on buffet because buffet is more or less the self-service approach um, for for meals, right? And we you should empower the people, you know, empower yeah. the people yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. is a beautiful yeah. thing, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's very important. That's, that's really nice. 
I love your thoughts. Yeah, and I and I think if um, and that's the way how you should think about the data culture, right? Because I think it's not not the right way to think. Okay, we need data culture, and data culture or data lineage means more or less explaining that data is good, and you you should you should use data. I think it's the way how you should think about data is very important, and how you should treat data to become more or less very important within your organization. And, and treating it as a product is really the the key thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 to do so without um, a lot of centralized governance, I think I think a lot of teams in the beginning when they just started this journey, you needed to centralize the resources because there weren't many people that had this kind of data centric thinking, this mindset, because most organizations are very application centric. So you had to bring together the like-minded uh, people uh, so they could drive things like standards and enterprise data models and things like that. Uh, but I, I think we're past that. You asked the question earlier about, you know, 10 years ago versus now. Uh, I think that those old organizational structures, those, you know, centralized BICCs and, and data integration competency centers, those are bottlenecks, right? Uh, and, and what's happened is you've got these centralized resources that are responsible for you know building the data warehouse or building the data marts and so on and on one side you have an exponential growth in the the people and software processes that want to consume data mm. and then on the other side you have exponential growth in the the data sources that you're interested in because it's it's not only internal data anymore it's also you know external data I want I want weather data I want regulatory data I want all my internal data I want all this stuff that's going on so you have exponential growth in data sources exponential growth in consumption and then a centralized team that's supposed to deliver all the answers and that just doesn't work and say well add more people to the team well we know that adding more people to a centralized team above a certain scale it just makes them slower you create more meetings you don't create more output right. uh and and so we need to decentralize the teams and i think there's the, there's some great work by a, a woman named ghani uh out of uh, silicon valley the san francisco bay area who wrote about this data mesh concept of really how to how to decentralize teams and align them to business process boundaries to create these data products. And, and then, then I think from an engineering point of view, our challenge is to then connect these data products so that we can, we can uh, deliver this concept, which Gartner many years ago coined as the logical data warehouse, where we take the different nodes in the data mesh and we connect them so that we can have you know, a, a, an exponential value proposition rather than a linear value proposition mm. with a bunch of isolated data products. Yeah, it's, it, it, if you if you compare it, it's I think curves is not the right word. Waves, it's always more like like waves. You're you're starting with a central person, then you have the decentral um, situation because they a lot of different departments start to hire pe data people. Then you have again a, a central function, and then you have again a decentral function. And but you need to find the right balance based based on the uh, data maturity within the organization to ensure that you serve the right needs, right? Or Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So yeah. It, the, the, the analogy I usually use is a pendulum, right? So this pendulum swings back and yeah, forth, yeah, yeah. centralized, decentralized. And and right now, I think many organizations, the, the pendulum is too far centralized. Now, if you, if you swing it too far the other way, complete decentralization equals anarchy, right? So, so I would argue you still need some governance, but not completely centralized, right? So, so some enterprise level governance around things like security and standards and how you generate surrogate IDs and, and things like that. This is, this is important stuff. Uh, but, you know, again, this term minimum viable governance, what is the minimum governance you need in order to make sure that you're creating interoperability and efficiency in delivering the data products within the organization? Stephen, I see. So I, I have to inspire you that we write something together in a new book about uh, out, about uh, those kind of topics. Absolutely, I'm game. Yeah. Do I get to pick the language? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I, I I will train my English for sure. Another then then we should go ahead. But I love it. I uh, um, I was thinking uh, Python actually, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, that yeah, I will. I will do my best. Yeah. Um. Yeah, if, if if we now go deeper within the organization, I think um, if you start to to find, let's say the first the first data use case, the first data product, I think I would 
always start in the marketing, in my opinion. Because um, it's very easy to find good and easy use cases for the marketing because they always would like to use data to improve their marketing, right? Ef efficiency and, and stuff like that. But in my opinion, in based on my experience in the last few years is that if marketeers have them, are sitting in the same meeting with data scientists, um, the outcome could be very difficult or could end up very uh, – uh, do you know what I mean? More or less, it could be – Yeah, although I, I would I – Two would sides argue, of a coin. Yeah, my yeah. experience is the marketing people aren't the problem. <laughs> I think it's actually the IT people that are the problem. Okay. So, so the, what I what I what I usually see is the marketing people and the data scientists. They actually get along very well because they have all these ideas of how to use data and so on. Yeah, yeah. And and it's the IT people who are usually the problem. No, 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 no. We can't do that. Oh no, no. Open source. No, 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 no. Too hard. <laughs> uh, we we have to do an enterprise data model. We have to do top down design. We have to do enterprise marketing people and data scientists. They they tend to be very opportunistic, very sort of bottoms up. And yeah. and and. You know, the, the analogy I sometimes make is the IT people are like the responsible parents. They control the budget. They make sure all the data is secure. They make sure we're being responsible and so on. The the data scientists and the marketing people, they're like teenagers, with lots of ideas yeah. and so on, <laughs> and completely out of control. They don't really pay much attention to the budgets and so on. They just want to create great ideas. And the reality is they both need each other, right? Because yeah. Data scientists are actually terrible data engineers. Uh, they are actually typically do not have the, I don't know if it's discipline or interest to, uh, you know, put things into fully automated production. Yeah. We need data engineers to do that, right? Yeah. And, and so they need each other. Uh, and, and the problem is, and, and many households have the same problems, why I use this analogy. The parents and the teenagers don't talk the same language. In fact, they don't even like to talk to each other, right? <laughs> you know, if you have a household where, you know, the teenager comes home from school, they go straight to their room, they don't talk to anybody and so on. This is a dysfunctional household. Yeah. And, and I would argue that there's a lot of benefit if you can get the parents and the teenagers to talk every single day, even only 15 minutes. So let's call that the daily stand-up. Right, where we okay. actually have a cross-functional team, we have the data engineers, we have the data scientists, we have the marketing product owners, and they're actually in the same meeting. And then we have family counselor to make sure we're collaborating. That's the scrum master, right? The scrum oh, master nice. is a collaborator, a communicator, and helping you know sort of uh, the the two sides communicate well. And if they spend 15 minutes together every day you start to actually appreciate the value that each you know person in the team brings to the table. Uh, and, and so actually, I think marketing and data scientist people, they get along great. It's, it's the IT people that, you know, if, 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 if the marketing and, and, and data science people develop a great model for predicting behavior and show that it has huge value, and they say, okay, we want to put this in production, and then IT says, oh, <laughs> what is this crappy code that you created? This is unusable, unmaintainable. It's going to take us six months to rewrite all this, and we're going to have to collect all the requirements and redesign and so on. This is a disaster. This is this old-style waterfall development methodology, throw the requirements over the fence to IT, doesn't yeah. work. Right, so I, I love this more uh, this this analytic ops or or agile plus DevOps when applied to to analytics, where you've yeah. got the data ops part for getting the data, and then the ML ops part for doing the machine learning, and and you're doing sprints in order to deliver the value rather than this kind of throw it over the fence waterfall kind of stuff. So to 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 cut the team together in a in a in a different way, right? So um, to to mix up. Um, Yeah, a, a product team. Let's call it product team or or, or, or a, a sprint team, right? To to yep. and to have different kind of yeah roles within the organization. Absolutely, and so so typically the team has five different skill sets, right? There's the 
the business product owner who's that marketing person who has this idea that he he wants to cross sell from this product to that product or whatever it is that they're trying to do or, or predict affection uh, renewals, whatever. Then you've got the data scientist skill set, which is kind of the power user, right hand person to the marketing person going to sort of understand the problem and then try to translate data into some value outcome. And then you've got data engineers. And I would argue there's two kinds of data engineers. There's the data acquisition engineers that go get the data that you need. And then there's the data consumption engineers that take the data and actually build some value proposition based on the work that the data scientist is doing, right? So there's two kinds of data engineers, very distinct skill sets, the consumption engineers and the acquisition engineers. And then the family counselor is that, that, that scrum master, which kind of program manager type of person. So those five skill sets we want in the team. It's a very cross-functional team. You allow the team to self-organize. You don't impose a structure on it. Uh, you keep the team small, right? I'm sure you've heard this uh, terminology, the, the, the two pizza principle, right? The yeah. Yeah, yeah, to be yeah. no bigger than uh, you can feed with two pizzas, right? Yeah, so that yeah. means between six and a dozen people. These are big American pizzas, right? So uh, keep the team small and it's productive. If you make the team big, then it becomes unproductive because then you spend all your time in meetings instead of delivering. But but how you would tackle the situation that, I, I, I in, in my opinion and based on my experience in the last month and years, it's, it's very important to start with an MVP. So minimal viable product, right? Absolutely. And to 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 prove the the value. So otherwise, Absolutely you have agree. the situation that you close the door um, um, for for your room, and you more or less uh, come out after after uh, six months, and you will ex ex yeah, uh, celebrate no, yourself so for for a great data product, and they all will more or less explain um, that's what not what it, what we would like to see, right? Uh, so what is, what is your idea to tackle this situation? So would you start within the, does the same team, the MVP, or would you more or less have one data scientist with a test data set to start? So, so I, I definitely agree with the MVP, and this team is responsible for creating the series of MVPs. So okay. this approach that I'm describing, you're, you're basically doing two or three week sprints. The yep. first sprint is a discovery sprint where you have an idea about yep. uh, you know how I can do cross selling, and then the data scientist goes in and gets the data, working together with the data engineers, and we try out some ideas. Can I predict the behavior of the customer uh, better with this data, together with some other data that's probably already in the data product? Yep. Can we build a better model? And if the answer is yes, okay. Now the second sprint is let's take some of the attributes that we need uh, and then promote them from the raw data in the data lake into uh, the the data product, which has appropriate lineage and service levels and so on. And then we can deploy the model. Uh, and it's the, just the first cut at the model. We're, we're not gonna, it's not necessarily gonna be all the data we would ever want, and we're gonna continue to improve the model. Our first model might be using a, you know, a simple linear model, uh, but then as yeah. we progress, we might say, well, okay, let's do a, a, a non-linear model with, instead of a, a regression, we're gonna do random forest, and then maybe eventually we evolve into, you know, a multi-layer neural network. But don't start with the multi-layer network to the to the point of your minimum viable product. Don't start with the hardest thing you can do. You know, get value incrementally uh, by increasing the sophistication of the the usage of the data as well as the the algorithms that you're applying for your your machine learning. But and and based if you more or less are sit if all people are sitting in the same boat, hope, hope, hopefully this, it's the same analogy in in English than in German. And uh, you have the situation that all people want to ensure that you that you have success right because if you're starting to with the first week you will see, get a business plan or with the second week you get a business plan then you will have two percent per improvement then there will be three percent per improvement five percent improvement and stuff like that and that's that's um within the within this journey all people will grow grow up and grow together to ensure that all feel very responsible for the result of the data product That's right. That's why you have to eliminate the us and them between IT yeah, yeah, yeah. and marketing and data scientists and so on. We're going to create yeah. a cross-functional team. And that team is empowered. And they make the commitments to themselves and to the organization that they're going to deliver. And if I get to define what is in scope for each sprint, then I'm going to be committed to it. If management says from above, you must build a model that you know in six weeks is going to do the following, this is nonsense, right? Because yeah. where did that? Where did six weeks come from? Where did the requirements... <laughs> 
<laughs> it, it, it doesn't work, right? So this yeah. kind of top-down pushing uh, uh, delivery dates and scope uh, do doesn't work very well. That's the that's the old style of doing things. Yeah, I think. If, but if if you if you more or less think about the situation that science science is always built on hypothesis and then you'll test something then there will be a good or a bad result you will improve yourself day by day week by week month by month and stuff like that then you will see that other kind of approaches will not really work right yeah i mean you know i think that adopting this Agile DevOps approach is yep. really a critical success factor for you know for innovation in 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 the data space for sure. Do you have an use case um, based on your experience where you have a, a really good result or a really bad result for for both kind of approaches? Uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, one uh, one of the the. I'll say bad results is when the marketing data science team weren't working well with the IT team. I'm not going to name the the, the, yeah, the sure. company, <laughs> but uh, just describe the scenario. Yeah. So basically, what they had figured out is they had a website, and they wanted to present you know content which is custom to the individual coming to the website, uh, recognizing all their past you know behaviors and what they bought and didn't buy and so on. Uh, and they they did this prototype where um, they they could build they built a machine learning model uh, that suggested next best action for this particular customer, uh, and it was based on you know that person we could identify when they come back to the website and uh, the results were huge it was you know between 300 and 500 percent improvement on oh God, basically yeah. sell through uh on, on the website so this is a great result yeah. but remember i told you this was a bad news story so, <laughs> so here's what happened uh so they had this great result and they they kind of prototyped it uh, uh with a a test audience and they said okay now we want to go like full production with this yeah. and it said oh wait a minute here this impacts the customer experience And if you impact the customer experience, then that is a you know critical level one system. And this this uh, data warehouse that you have, it doesn't have disaster recovery. And so all critical you know level one systems have to have a disaster recovery solution. Uh, and so we have to then take what you built on the data warehouse and we're going to port it to this operational data store. We're going to use our you know our transaction processing technology to do this because we have full DR capability and so on. And after nine months, then we can <laughs> give you something. And by the way, you have to pay for all of this. You have to pay for us to rebuild the database and make a disaster recovery. And marketing is going to we did this we did this prototype in like in in weeks and now you're going to take nine months and charge us through the nose and we did this like a skunk works it, yeah. it cost us almost nothing and so they argued for you know for months about this because marketing didn't want to pay for it and said no we you know we want the value immediately and so on and finally what the marketing people did is say look right now if someone comes to the website they get generic content everybody sees the same so If our data warehouse is down, we give them the generic content. It's no worse than what they get today. But if the data warehouse is not down, then we're going to use this machine learning, do the scoring in real time, and then do it. And, and we're going to get this 300 to 500% benefit. And there is no risk to a worse customer experience than what they have today for us doing what we just described. And then IT couldn't argue with that. So <laughs> so they said, oh, well, we're uncomfortable, but I guess we don't really have a choice here. And so then they went out and did it. And it was hugely successful. Uh, but it was it took them months longer than it should, not because of anything technical, but because of organizational us yeah. and them and, you know, see the, these arbitrary rules. And they, they weren't communicating well. They weren't collaborating. Uh, they didn't really have a shared goal because marketing's goal was to increase sales. IT's goal was to make sure they met all the service levels as defined by what means business critical and, and, and so on. So they didn't have shared goals and that led to dysfunctional behavior. Uh, so that, that there was kind of both good news and bad news in that particular example. But the, the good news could have been a lot sooner had they been working together more closely. That, uh, that's a very, very good example. And I think it's always having all people in the same 
in the same boat and explaining what could be the goal, more or less could um, discuss it and confirm it from, from different point of views and then we can, or the, the team can go ahead. Yeah. And I think then you more or less eliminate the, the, the politic stuff, right? And to be honest, there's always a bit of politics. Yeah, and it's also a matter of what is your mindset? I think that many people think of, you know, the data warehouse, oh, that's just for reporting. Just reporting. You know, I think reporting is the, it is necessary because we have regulators and we have people that, you know, in finance that want to look at reports, but it's the least interesting thing you do with the data warehouse, right? The interesting stuff happens when you're impacting the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so you have strategic intelligence, which helps us understand the long-term planning, but then you've got operational intelligence, which allows you to act right now based on what's happening right now and take informed action to create better outcomes. I was with a large uh, uh, logistics company in, in, in Germany yesterday and, and you know they are amazing with the kind of things that they do with the data to make sure that you know uh, the deliveries that they're making to their customers are on time. They're tracking against fraud. They're making sure that you know if they need to reroute they do it before the package is late and so on. It is you know it, it, it's a very sophisticated use of data because they're not trapped in this old world of data warehouses for reporting. Yes, of course, you can do reporting for a data warehouse, but this is like 20 years ago thinking about what is a data warehouse for. Yeah, right. I think that's the, the more or less the, the start of business intelligence, right? To, to provide reports, but we are, based on our current maturity, we are far away from doing classic reports. Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, <laughs> Yeah, Stephen, th thanks a lot. Um, I think it, it's a really amazing episode and um, hopefully the listeners feel our passion about, about data, but I, I think they will. Um, could you Lou, sum up our episode? What, what do you think should be the three takeaways for, for our listeners? I think that, uh, you know, number one is treat data as a product to be consumed and create value, not as an asset. Yep. Uh, number two, I would say uh, move quickly, right? And, you know, use this yep. uh, data ops, uh, machine learning ops, small teams, cross-functional teams, self-organizing. Use the best of what we learn in software engineering around agile DevOps and apply that to uh, apply that to the data in order to, uh, to get maximum value. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the the third point, uh, I think, is around, um, you know, the, the teamwork uh, between the IT teams and the data science teams and the business product owners. It, it's kind of related to the second point. You need uh, that teamwork. And it's not about technology. It's about uh, making sure that you have good teamwork uh, and that you have the autonomy and self-service and this minimum viable governance kind of approach approach uh, for uh, a, a decentralized approach to delivering value from data. Those are the, the key points. And, and, you know, overriding that is, you know, in the cloud, you are going to innovate much more quickly. So think about how you're going to use these techniques in, in, in the cloud environment to accelerate innovation. Nice. Really nice. So there are always more or less two questions um, for my guests. Uh, one is, um, what do you do privately with, with data? And the second is, how would you describe your, your data game um, yeah, with, a, with a film or movie title? What I do with the data, you know, I'm I'm a bit of a data geek, yeah. so I collect lots of data. There's a guy from Wired magazine named Kevin Kelly, who coined a term uh, that I've kind of adopted called the quantified self. So basically, it means collect all the data about yourself. So I can tell you, you know, everywhere that I've been for the last 20 years by day, exactly oh. where I've been. And and I've and I've traveled to over 170 countries, so I move a lot. Yeah. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, I was only in the same city for more than five consecutive days twice in the previous 20 years. 
So I move very fast. And so I keep track of everything. Uh, I, uh, I, I know where I've been. I know what books I've read. I know what you know, movies I've seen. I, I know which clients that I've worked with. I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, a quantified self kind of person. That also goes for, for health things. So tracking health uh, uh, aspects in terms of you know, the number of steps you walk a day. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a huge hiker. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, the mountains of Pakistan uh, in a couple of weeks oh, to do some. Nice. Nice. Amazing trekking there with a, a team of people that have gone with, uh, not during COVID, but before that for many years. And so uh, I'm a huge hiker and, you know, I collect data on my hikes as well. Uh, and I have both structured and unstructured data. So I have lots of pictures as, in addition <laughs> to the, you know, the structured data for, uh, for, for what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So. And the, the second question about the, the movie title or film title? If I were to to sort of create the 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 film uh, title, or actually, I prefer books over films, so I'm going to change your question a little bit. Yeah. So it's kind of a book title. Yeah. Because uh, the book is always better than the film, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, data saves the world, and and what do I mean by that? I, I kind of hinted at it earlier. Uh, I think that data is the key to sustainability. Right. So we're having a lot of discussions. I had big discussions yesterday with this logistics company, yep. uh, a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, what does sustainability mean? And I would argue that the key to saying that sustainability is transparency and transparency comes with the data. And we can use Amazing. the data to build machine learning models to uh, to create a more sustainable society. So there are many different dimensions of sustainability in terms of uh, you know economic sustainability and and diversity and and uh, carbon footprint and so on. But let's just take the carbon footprint as an example. Uh, you know, many companies have built activity-based costing models to measure profitability of their products. Whether you're a retailer or a bank or a telecommunications company or or a logistics company, we 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 build these activity based costing models. Well, we can take these activity-based costing models that count euros and we can count CO2. Yeah. And so now I can track for every item I sell on the store shelf, what was the CO2 footprint of that, that item? And I don't mean just scope one, I mean scope one, two, and three. So full transparency to the full Amazing. value chain for sustainability on that, that carbon footprint. And then I can start building machine model, machine learning models to optimize sustainability using the data. And, and, and even let's say for a bank, right? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm a bank, who do I choose to give loans to? Should I choose to give loans to people who are polluting the atmosphere or to people who are investing in wind farms, for example? Right. And so, you know, it is not the goal of the bank to be a uh, to be giving away money. Right. They have mm. to make a profit. Otherwise, they're not going to be sustainable themselves. Right. But the, the problem is, if you, if you create a, a Venn diagram, here's profitable business and here's sustainable business. If it's only a thin slice that overlaps, mm. then we're not going to get enough sustainability. But we can use machine learning to actually create business models where we create a stronger overlap in the Venn diagram between profitable business and sustainable business. And I, and I think data is the key to that. And that's, that's why I call it data saves the world, because I think the world, quite frankly, is in trouble. Uh, and, and we need to take positive steps uh, to, to do this and proactive steps. And, and data is really the key to success. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, you're right. I think that's good thoughts after, after the episode. Nice. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the conversation.